Alright, welcome to basic airway management and airway and oxygen techniques uh, for week number two. So we're talking about basic airway management. There's lots of things that we need to consider. Number one is body positioning. In a conscious patient, how do conscious patients typically like to present when they're having difficulty breathing? Tripod. A tripod is another position. What else? Sitting up. Sitting up. Do they typically like to lay flat? No. No. Everybody's going to vary. Every patient is going to be different in the position that they like. The important thing to remember when we talk about these patients is to keep them in the position that's the best for them. Um, that helps them breathe as long as they're conscious. Next position, what about supine patients? What, when do we typically have patients in the supine position? After they've been involved in something that compromises C spine? Alright, yeah. After they've been involved in something that compromises C spine, what about unconscious patients? How are they typically? They're typically going to be in the supine position as well. What are problems that we have with patients that are supine? They can choke on their saliva. Okay, they can choke on their saliva. What else? Their tongue can fall back. The tongue Occlude can fall the back. Could the airway. Okay. So there's lots of complications. It's not something that we really radically, really want to prefer to use. We'd rather use some other type of method. Prone patients. Are there ever times that we have to deal with patients that are in the prone position? Yes. What makes de dealing with prone patients difficult? Their head will be cocked off one side. <clears throat> They're flexed. Yeah, there's no way to really truly get to their airway and truly manage it if they're in a prone position. So that in and of itself makes it difficult. Now, the, the position we learn is basics and we always never use because we just don't do it. And that's called the recovery position. <clears throat> what are the benefits of the recovery position? They're not likely to aspirate. Why? Because they're facing out and down. They're All right. All right. So when we have a patient that's in the left lateral recumbent or recovery position, they're going to be more inclined for all of the saliva, all the other stuff to come out of their mouth. Now, what about patients? Uh, what else is, do we? What other benefit do we get from that? We know that when we have a patient supine, their tongue falls back and includes their airway. What about if they're on their left side? Is their tongue going to fall back and include the airway? Fall off the side. All right. So a left lateral recumbent is truly a good position for us to consider to utilize if we're not having to manage their airway. So, <clears throat> the key to being a paramedic is to be a good basic, all right, and that is the key. Well, when we talk about airway management, there's, we don't always have to assume that we need to innovate someone. We don't always assume that we need to do some type of advanced airway procedure. Just using basic airway procedures in and of themselves, and especially the manual airway procedures, are what we need to utilize most of the time. But the thing that we often neglect and overlook is we don't do manual airway procedures. When we bag someone, how many how many times do we actually uh, do a head tilt chin lift? When we put an OPA in, do we actually open the airway? We have somebody that's under C-spine precautions. Do we actually take the time to do that jaw thrust on most of these patients? No. We just go ahead and pull off the toys and start shoving the toys in. And it's because they, it requires manual dexterity and practice. And that's things that we need to really truly work on and we will work on in the lab is how to manage the airway manually with just good old hands and elbow strength. So the head tilt chin lift is going to be the preferred method for a patient that's supine and doesn't have any spinal injuries. And it's going to provide the best, uh, best airway management. Why does the head tilt chin lift maneuver work so well for us? The airway, it, up. it extends the airway, opens it up. It's easy. It's it's easy to do. Okay. It elevates the hyoid bone off the pharynx, right? right? And it gets that airway more neutral in position. What else does it do with the with the tissues in the upper airway? Does it move them out of the way? Does it help to displace the tongue in some regard to keep the airway open? Yes. Okay. So we all know how to do a head tilt chin lift. One hand underneath the jaw, the other on the top of the head, and we're going to lift up and open that airway up. Now what about the tongue jaw lift? What is a tongue jaw lift? Well, it's used for C-spine. Okay, patients that have a C-spine. Okay. It's manually pulling the jaw forward. 
the anterior. Okay. Um, we most typically use a tongue jaw lift truthfully. You're kind of confusing this with a jaw thrust. The tongue jaw lift is what we use a lot of times when we need to open an airway up. Like let's say you got a big old hunk of steak in the airway. Right, you need to clear that bad boy out of there. You're going to do a tongue jaw lift so that way you get it out. All right? uh, or you're going to put a combi tube in or you're going to put some other type of airway device down the airway or you're going to suction. You're going to do a tongue jaw lift. Okay. Um, it's not used for ventilation um, and again it's going to prevent you from even being able to get a adequate seal because where's your fingers going to be at? In the mouth. In the mouth. Okay, so it's good for soft tissue upper airway obstructions and unresponsive patients. You want to be real careful with patients that may have a fractured jaw or a dislocated jaw. Alright. What we just said, uh, Mr. C compromise. C spine compromise. Alright. It's good for soft tissue upper uh, upper airway obstructions, unresponsive patients and patients that are unable to protect their own airway. Okay. The good thing about it is it doesn't require any special special equipment. When we talk about a jaw thrust, what makes it so difficult? You have to hold it. You have to hold it the whole time. How easy is it to ventilate someone and hold a, a jaw thrust? Very difficult. Very difficult. And that's why we're going to talk about the rules of twos. And we'll talk about the rule of twos in lab. You're not going to find it in the lecture here because it's, it's just something we're going to practice in lab. Anytime we do anything that has to do with airway, we, we do a few things. Two people. It really, truly takes two people to effectively manage an airway. The next part of the rule of twos is two adjuncts. You're going to at least have two adjuncts in their airway. Okay? Two fingers. Cricoid pressure. Holding that cricoid pressure to prevent aspiration. All right, two PSIs, not forcefully ventilating the patient when we ventilate, and two inches or two inches of head elevation to get that airway in a more neutral position. As you can see on the jaw thrust maneuver without head to tilt lift slide, you can see with a good uh, axis as we have there, we're talking about airway uh, and how easy the air can actually move down into the lungs. The thing to remember about the jaw thrust maneuver, though, is it is not as, effect, as effective as a head tilt chin lift. And that is very important that we remember that. Um, a head tilt chin lift is preferred, but again, if we have a patient that's got cervical trauma, we're going to be stuck doing a jaw thrust. Again, it's going to. Excuse me, I went the wrong direction there. Um, so, oral airways. The oral airway is an, a rigid curved device made from hard plastic or similar material. There's lots of different options out there. You know we've got the ones that have the open lumen in them. We have the different color coded. Um, we have the Bermans. We have multiple different types of OPAs. But they're all pretty much the same. They've got a flange and they've got a curve. The curve lifts the tongue up. The flange either rests on the lips or the teeth and allows for the airway to maintain and stay in place. Um, when properly inserted, it's going to be at the teeth of the lips, like I said, and it's going to lift that tongue up. You know, what's the problem if we use an, an OPA that's too small? You want to get to the airway. Or it's not going to get to the airway. All right. If anything, it could possibly push that tongue back further because it's going to rest on the tongue and push back. What about using it on somebody that has uh, an, uh, <coughs> uh, well, what about using one that's too big? You're just going to block the airway. It itself is going to include the airway. So again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. You know how to use one. Variety of links. you got to size them. How do we measure them? From the corner of the mouth to the edge of the jaw. From the corner of the mouth to the edge of the jaw, or the angle of the jaw, or the earlobe. Depending on how what you were taught or what verbiage you used, it's all the same thing. We're going to say the angle of the jaw to the lips. All right? <coughs> you can see there in your picture on how you actually measure it. Um, Tim, we use these as a t to test the gag reflex. Now we all know, we all learned the eyelash flutter test for checking gag reflex. Here's the reality of the eyelash flutter test. Yes, it works, but no, it doesn't work. How's that for an answer? All right. The cranial nerve that provides gagging also is connected to the nerve that causes eyelash flutter. However, here's the deal. 
Just because someone doesn't have eyelash flutter does not mean that they don't have a gag reflex. However, anybody that has eyelash flutter is going to probably have a gag reflex. Does that make sense? All right. So many times we're not truly going to know if they have a, uh, a gag reflex until we put the OPA in. And we'll pull this OPA out, put it in, find out that they're gagging, suction them out, good to go. We know we're not going to be able to use anything else. Or we put this OPA in and find out that this is what we're going to need to use. <coughs> and then move and use this other type of airway. Um, so the thing that a lot of people forget about when using oral airways is you've also got to manually keep the airway open. That's very important to remember. We talk about these patients, once you put an OPA in, you still need to do a head tilt chin lift. You still need to do a jaw thrust or something those lines. These augment. But like I said at the beginning of this lecture, nothing works as well as your manual, with your hands, airway management techniques. These are just things that are there, tools, to augment keeping that airway patent. Okay. And there you can see a little table there. <clears throat> from the airway management textbook um, by AOSS that I that I got this from of uh, the different uh, types of oral uh, or the different indications and contraindications for for oral airway. Again, this is all review for you from being a basic. Um, nothing new here. Nasal trumpets or nasal airways, flexible rubber or silicone based. Um, we know that uh, we put the MPAs in. Um, which not nostril do we typically use? Right. Is it the right? Is it the left? Do they have right-sided NPAs? Do they have left-sided NPAs? Or are they all the same? <laughs> it doesn't matter really which nose you use. It's just the technique that you utilize when you get there. So obviously on the left nair, it's going to go straight down. On the right nair, we're going to have to do some rotation. That's what the difference comes down to. But it's a conduit for air inspired through the uh, through the uh, through the lumen. Uh, air is going to pass through. The great thing about using an NPA is again we can use it on semi-conscious patients or patients that still have a gag reflex. <coughs> Nasal airways are good airways. They're often over times overlooked, but there's nothing wrong with an NPA in someone. When we insert it, we need to make sure that we lube it up uh, and insert it through the curvature and the contour of the airway. With the bevel uh, against the nasal spec, uh, septum. Um, again, it's uh, um, you place it in the right nair or the left nair. Uh, it just depends. Again, one is going to be a little more easier to get down. When we talk about the left nair, we're going to do some rotation with it. No big deal there. How does an MPA work? Why can we use it on a patient that doesn't have a gag reflex? <coughs> Yeah, it by you, it, you don't you bypass you bypass the gag reflex basically, and it's going to go right back and it's going to go into the hypopharynx area right before and allow that air to have a clear pass through. All right, things that we need to be careful with when we talk about them: those patients that don't tolerate them, nasal fractures obviously don't want to cause more harm. Uh, patients that have nasal airway obstructions, maybe they have polyps in their nair, uh, deviated septums. Patient has a deviated septum, obviously you don't want to use that. And patients that have coagulopathies. What are coagulopathies? Well, not blood clots, but patients that have like hemophilia or they're on rat poison or coumadin on a daily basis. You gotta be kind of careful with that because you might get a nosebleed that you're not able to stop. <coughs> but again, it is a good option for you. Um, upper airway suctioning. Probably the most underutilized piece of equipment that we have on the ambulance and in medicine in general, and that's suction. And the reason why is because we're lazy. We don't want to take the portable suction unit in the house, and then not only do we not want to take the portable suction unit into the house, we don't want to have to take the time to clean it. <coughs> so it causes it causes us lots of problems. But patients should be suctioned. Um, and we shouldn't be afraid to use suction. It doesn't take long to clean out that uh, canister. It doesn't take long to change out the tubing or the yonker. Um, again, it gives us the best chances of preventing aspiration and keeping the airway open. I mean, come on. Dentists use it. You go to the dentist's office and have some dental work done. What's he doing the whole time he's working in your mouth? 
Suction. Suction you out. Why is he okay. doing that? So you don't ask. All right. So we got to have the suction unit itself and a suction catheter. Um, we should be able to get a pressure of 300 millimeters of mercury uh, and an airflow of about 30 limits per, per minute when it's fully opened um, to get that suction out. Four types of suction units, the mounted vacuum powered units, um, which we have in the ambulance, the Rico suction units, the battery operated units, and we all have the, the hand powered units, like a VBAC, some of the other ones. They still work, not the best thing in the world, but they do the job. And then we have oxygen powered units. We'll actually, uh, some places will actually have these and plug them into the oxygen source, and they actually will draw in that negative pressure from that which will create that vacuum to help uh, do the actual suction. So the mounted vacuum, most, uh, most powerful, most reliable, very strong. Uh, they're easily to adjust. The problem with them are is you can't get them into the, into the house. They're mounted onto the truck. And unfortunately, you can't put on 150 foot of, uh, of hose to take, a, take it into the house and, and vacuum out grandma's airway. All right. But again, it is going to be the best option, and it is in the back of the ambulance for us. The next thing we've got is the battery powered. They're lightweight. They're battery powered. The problem with those are is everybody forgets to check the batteries, or they don't maintain the battery. So then when you go to pull it off the truck, the battery's dead. But as long as they're charged and the batteries are well maintained, they do the job. Um, and they will uh, the section <coughs> taken care of. Um, the negative pressure is going to be generated uh, by uh, by covering the hole, just like uh, on the uh, on a regular suction unit. Um, most of these units are not adjustable. Um, the newer generations are are adjustable in the amount of pressure that you can actually suction with, but a lot of them are simply you turn them on or you turn them off, and they've got the suction capability. Um, Again, the big downfall is not maintaining them. They sit there. They're like the stepchild of EMS. They sit on the shelf. They collect dust. Nobody ever looks at them. Nobody ever turns them on until crap is really, really bad. We have that patient that there's vomit everywhere. Oh, my God, we've got to innovate. Get the portable suction unit. You go out to the truck. The portable suction unit comes in the house. You turn it on, and then it goes, and it's dead. All right. So again, make sure and maintain your portable suction unit. Make that your quest in life. Make sure your portable suction unit is maintained. Hand powered, the VVAX. Again, the VVAX work okay. Um, they're simple, inexpensive. Um, they're smaller and lighter than the battery powered units. Um, they fit into your bag really well. But again, they're limited on the amount of suction and what they will actually pull out. They can section out a lot of large quantity things. Um, and again, they have a wider lumen in terms of, of what they have. If you have to, you can pop off the little filter because uh, some of them have a filter on them. Uh, and again, you can get in there and you can really section out their airway and get their airway cleared out very quickly. Um, but again, there, nothing's going to work as well as your manual suction units. The other thing is, is they've got a fluctuation in pressure. And the other thing is the volume that they hold. They hold a very, very small amount of volume. So, again, once you fill them up, you either got to change the canister out or you spin, you're going to have to look for something else. Um, older oxygen regulators have the, uh, have the ability to create the negative pressure for suctioning. Uh, you got to have a high flow oxygen device to be able to do this. Um, Again, it's not something that we see very commonly. Um, I'm not real familiar with anybody around these parts of this part of the world that actually carries suction powered portable suctioning. <clears throat> when we talk about suction catheters, we've got our whistle tips, we got our yonkers, uh, different types. Each one has their own specific use. Um, and again, they're they're there, and you need to know how to utilize them. Um, yonkers are obviously going to be used for suction in the mouth. Um, but again, we use those, uh, the whistle tips, suction out the nose. How many of us think to suction out the nose on patients that are having trouble breathing, uh, or have a lot of secretions in their, in their nasal airway? Um, again, and the other thing that we get into too, sometimes we have to go back a little, a little deeper. 
So we need to use those whistle tips to be able to get in there and actually set out those contents. So there you can see a whistle tip and you can see a yonker. Um, again, sometimes the whistle tip is called a flexible catheter. <coughs> so rigid suction catheter is known as the uh, yonker tonsil tip. Hard plastic, uh, easy maneuver, uh, and uh, again, they get in there and they get the job done. They've got a wider opening, so they're going to suction out more, uh, more than a lot quicker. Uh, most of them are going to have a vent on them, and the vent is what you hold to activate the negative pressure to suction out. Some of them, however, will not have that hole, and they're constantly suctioning and have that negative pressure. So once you go in, they're going to go ahead and start suctioning as soon as you get in there. Um, but again, these are going to be the preferred device that we use when we talk about uh, suctioning out a patient's airway. Flexible suction catheters, or the whistle tips, uh, are flexible tubing, multiple openings. Um, they can be placed around airway adjuncts. Uh, they're very versatile. Uh, you know, driving a Yonker is like driving an 18-wheeler. Driving a, uh, a whistle tip is like driving a Prius. You're going to be able to maneuver in and out little crevices a little bit easier. Uh, we can also use these whistle tips to set, suction out the trachea and bronchial uh, of the intubated patient. Okay, and help us with uh, manifestations that have stomas as well. You've got to activate them by covering the hole, which is going to create that negative pressure to help suction things out. Um, there are complications and there are things that you need to consider uh, when we suction patients. Number one is suctioning too long. We don't want to make them hypoxic. You probably learned in school you suction no longer than 15 seconds, which is a good rule of thumb and something that you need to follow. But the reality is you need to suction until you get the stuff cleared out of their airway. Because otherwise, what are you going to do? Let it fall back in. It's going to fall right back in or you're going to force it in there. <coughs> so there are some strategies that we can use. You want to try to ventilate the patient with 100% oxygen for two to three minutes prior to suctioning. Okay, that's all fine, well, and good. But again, what are you going to do when that patient's got stuff in their airway from the get-go? You're going to have to suction them out. Okay. Um, but again, you want to try to get them on that 100% oxygen as soon as you possibly can. Um, you want to try to, again, limit your suctioning to under 10 seconds or under 15 seconds. But sometimes volume is going to prohibit you from being able to do that. The other thing that we need to consider when we talk about suctioning are the stimulation of the vagus nerve. What happens when we stimulate that vagus nerve when we suction a patient's airway? Yeah, we're going to get a decreased heart rate. People oftentimes forget about that. They're suctioning out the patient's airway, and they're looking at the monitor, and they see, oh, the patient's down to 52, and they were just at 90 for a pulse rate. Why? Because we put pressure on the vagus nerve, and we cause their <coughs> we cause them to uh, break down a little bit. All right. Um, just curious, how far can you break it down if you kept suctioning? Oh, you can break them down to the 30s or the 40s if you kept going. Yeah, I mean, that vagus nerve, you put enough pressure on there, you'll get it, you'll get it going pretty good. <coughs> now, stomas. How many of you guys have dealt with a patient that had a stoma mm -hmm. before? All right. What are stomas there for? Airway. From what? Surgery. Yeah, they've had a sometimes they had a laryngectomy. Typically, all right. The problems with stomas is they get lots of thick, nasty secretions that get up in there, and it's down low, and it causes airway obstructions. It makes it difficult for these patients to breathe. A lot of times we've got to go in there and we've got to clear the occlusion, suction out those stomas, so you've got to be prepared to deal with them. The thing to remember is you've got to do this very carefully. Um, if you irritate that tracheal wall while we're sectioning, and sectioning out a patient that's got a stoma, a lot of times we can cause a laryngeal spasm. We cause a laryngeal spasm, what's that going to cause to occur? It's going to close off. It's going to close off the airway. If we close off the airway, what if we just prevent it from happening? Oxygenation. Yeah, oxygenation is going to to exist. <coughs> All right. A lot of times we also have to uh, uh, replace tracheostomy tubes. Patients will dislodge them um, or they'll become occluded. 
so if we have to re, uh, replace a patient that has a tracheostomy, um, there are some steps that we can use to, to help with this. But again, the goal is going to be able to replace and get them back to ventilatory support. We'll practice using this in the lab, but using a Shiley to get a, a stoma back in there. Uh, many patients will have an extra one laying around that you may have help with insertion of. Um, other times, again, you may have to make do and improvise in the actual replacement. So regardless of whether or not the stoma requires suctioning or the tracheostomy tube needs to be reinserted, you must be prepared to take immediate action. Because again, the rules of medicine are still as follows. If the patient is alive, it's A, B, C. Airway, breathing, circulation. If you don't have an airway, you don't have a patient. And just like when we talk about with the uh, patients that have uh, dead patients, it's CAB. But what's the second letter right after C? Airway. Airway. So airway is always going to be paramount and one of the most important things that we do. So any questions on uh, basic airway management techniques? All right, let's talk a little bit about supplemental oxygen therapy. Again, we're moving through this lecture kind of quick because, again, it should be a review for you. Um, when we have patients that have uh, uh, widespread uh, 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 hypoxia, it's going to lead to tissue death. you got to have oxygen in order to live. That's that's just the key to things. Um, so we have to have a constant supply and a constant delivery of oxygen to patients. As we know, room air oxygen concentration is roughly 21%, a little bit less than that. Um, but patients that are having a physiological disturbance or some type of uh, air, some type of uh, medical emergency or traumatic emergency, 21% is oftentimes not going to be enough to to sustain life. So we're going to have to give them supplemental oxygen. Every every cell in our body requires oxygen. That's that's the way you're designed. That's how things have to be done. We've got to have we've got to have uh, oxygen to convert glucose into energy. Uh, without oxygen, we cannot get energy. Just about just think about fire. Fire has to have fuel, right? But will fire burn without oxygen? No, you've got to have oxygen. Oxygen is a drug. And it is the most common drug we administer in emergency medicine. So, uh, again, you should already be familiar with oxygen and how to use oxygen and what to do with oxygen from being a basic and from being an intermediate. And this is going to serve as a quick review for us. Uh, oxygen has very few side effects. Um, there really is no contraindication for the administration of oxygen. Now, there is lots of research out on the uh, out on the airways now talking about free radicals and um, and the actual uh, destruction of tissue by oxygen. Um, but again, for the most part, and, and until until we truly have good definitive data, oxygen is still our friend, and oxygen is still good. Not every patient needs to be placed on 15 liters by a non-rebreather mask. Um, but again, oxygen has lots of effects that we need for the body. Now, there is a contraindication for oxygen, and that is paraquat poisoning. Um, and if those of you that don't know what paraquat poisoning are, is, um, I strongly encourage you to look up paraquat. I'm not going to talk about that right now. You might get that a little bit later on uh, in paramedic school when uh, Mr. Boulder lectures to you about toxicology. But right now, I would, uh, if you're curious and want to know, do a little side reading on paraquat. So, what it warrants oxygen administration? Well, difficulty breathing does, obviously. Respiratory compromise. Circulatory compromise. Shock. Decreased level of consciousness. Patients that have an oxygen saturation less than 96%. Uh, and anybody that's got a hypoxic or an ischemic mechanism. We want to consider giving these patients. So we know that oxygen is transported in the body in two ways. It's either bound to hemoglobin or dissolved in plasma. Uh, increasing the percentage of oxygen in the inspired gas increases both the SpO2 and the PaO2. All right, the amount of pressure of the oxygen uh, and the actual saturation. 
but we know that we got to have enough buses to actually carry the oxygen around. If SO2, SO2 decreases, an increase in the percentage of oxygen in the breathing gas will make more oxygen molecules available to load in the buses and be transported on the hemoglobin. How many, how many oxygens fit onto a hemoglobin molecule? Four. Four. It's fully loaded. But again, what if we've lost two or three liters of blood? Buses. We've lost buses. So even if we've got all those buses full, we may show that we have an oxygen saturation of 100%, but we truly don't have a good oxygen saturation because we don't have enough buses to carry them all around. All right. So we want to make sure that we maintain a proper saturation. Um, but again, not only do we want to make sure that we have a proper saturation, we want to make sure that we have enough buses to carry that oxygen around. So SpO2 represents the percentage of available hemoglobin that is saturated. But again, a pulse oximeter does not provide all that information. It just can tell us that we've got them fully loaded. It doesn't tell us that we're actually delivering plenty of oxygen to the body. <laughs> There's lots of things <coughs> that can go wrong with SpO2. Now, all of you, I think, are New, are New Mexico basics and intermediates. So you're able to use a pulse ox from the time you're a basic. But here, for a long time, there's lots of places that don't even let basics touch a pulse oximeter. Because pulse oximeters are dangerous. How many times have we seen the patient that has an O2 sat of 100%, but you look at him and you're like, um, no way this patient has 100% SpO2. Or on the other side of the coin, you look at a patient that's got an O2 sat of 62%. And you know good and well that they're sat at least in the 90s. So again, it can be misleading. It's just a tool to help augment. It's not the end-all, be-all of uh, inflammation. So again, even patients that have a normal pulse ox, you still may consider giving them a supplemental oxygen. Uh, patients that are having an AMI, a stroke, or some other hypoxic problem, you, you definitely want to consider giving them oxygen. So, just as a review, we talked about this last week. You should have got an A and P. Air has 78% nitrogen, 20, almost 21% oxygen. We got a little argon in the mix, and we've got carbon dioxide in the mix. And there are some other gases that are thrown in there, but these are the most prevalent gases in our atmosphere. This is what we breathe in every time we take a breath. So, how much oxygen do we give to who? And to who do we give that much oxygen to? What's going to tell you? Patient condition. Patient condition. Clinical judgment. Your clinical decision making. What you think the patient needs. <coughs> Dosage of oxygen is going to be obviously in liters per minute. But does every patient need 15 liters per minute? No. Does every patient need 4 liters per minute? No. Does every patient need 2 liters per minute? No. No. Everybody's different. You've got to base it on what the patient's presentation is and what you feel like is going to benefit that patient. <clears throat> we also have the decimal equivalent of oxygen, which is FiO2, and you need to become familiar with FiO2. Okay, Room air has an FiO2 of 0 0.2. 1. Okay, huh. 21%. So if I tell you a patient has an FiO2 of 0.5, what, how much oxygen is that? 50%. What about if I tell you you got an FiO2 of 1.0? 10%. No, 100%. 100%. Okay. So FiO2 is the, um, is the decimal equivalent to percentage. Okay. It's the amount of oxygen being administered. When we talk about ventilator settings later on, this is what we're talking about and this is what we're dealing with. This FiO2. <clears throat> <clears throat> it's always better to err on the side of giving too much oxygen than too little. Okay, but again, don't remember not everybody has to have high flow oxygen. But if you're in doubt, give them some, give them high flow. It's much better to give somebody 15 liters per minute um, than to say, ah, oh, let's just give you two liters per minute and find out that they really could have benefited from 15 liters. So use your use your good clinical judgment skills that you've all got. All right. Using their level of respiratory distress is another way that you can do it. Um, gauge it from there. Titrate it up. Titrate it down. Whatever you need to warn them 
patient's condition. Again, you are going to be paramedics. All right? You don't need to be a cookbook paramedic. You should be a critical thinking paramedic and be able to utilize the physical exam, the tools that you have in your toolbox, the patient's condition, history. All of these things should help guide you in how much oxygen you should give patients. Don't just give them 15 liters because that's what we do. Don't just give them 4 liters because that's what we do. All too often we're ha creatures of habit and we fall into a habit of doing the same thing over and over again. I'm just as guilty as the next. But again, use what's appropriate. <coughs> in the grand scheme of things, oxygen is not harmful in the resuscitation of the acutely ill. So we should never withhold oxygen to patients. Now, hypoxic drive. Who wants to tell me about hypoxic drive? Yeah, it's where people breathe off of the uh, amount of CO2 instead of the amount of oxygen. They, they uh, you can use too much oxygen in a. You sure it's not the amount of CO2? It's the amount of. They don't have enough oxygen. Right. They monitor oxygen. We breathe instead. off of a CO2 drive. We breathe off of a carbonic drive. Patients that have chronic lung disease breathe based on the amount of oxygen. So this should be a review for you. All right. This is a backup mechanism that our body has to make sure that we're getting adequate ventilation and adequate respiratory uh, respiration. So the hypoxic drive regulates the respiratory uh, uh, balance based on the concentration of oxygen in the blood. Uh, for us, the stimulus to breathe is carbon dioxide. For these patients, the stimulus to breathe is the amount of oxygen in blood. So, it creates a dilemma, patients that have a hypoxic drive. If you don't give the patient oxygen, the patient's condition may progress to respiratory failure. But if you increase the oxygen level, you may actually cause a patient to quit breathing. So what do you do? How do you manage this? You titrate it. You give them what they need. What happens if they quit breathing? Turn it down. You turn it off and you ventilate them. All right, until they come back to. All right. Always err on the side of giving them oxygen. If you've got a COPD patient that's on three liters per minute, nasal cannula, and they're sitting there and they're struggling to breathe, three liters ain't cutting it. All right. You think four liters is going to cut it? Giving them just one extra liter? Probably not. So should we probably pull out the big guns? Yeah, we probably should. Okay. <coughs> Hyperventilation syndrome. What is that? Breathing too fast, blowing off too much CO2. Yeah. We're breathing too fast or we're blowing off too much CO2. That's exactly it. All right. It causes us to go into respiratory alkalosis. Ah, as a review from last week, what would respiratory alkalosis be? Oh. Oh dear God, let me open up that lecture and look it up really quick. Alright. The bicarbonate's the daddy. <laughs> bicarbonate is going to be the daddy? It's respiratory. CO2 is going to be the daddy. CO2 is going to be the daddy. Alright, remember the Morty Public Show. CO2 is the daddy. Uh, so is CO2 going to be high or low? Low. Low. But we're going to have a pH that's going to be high. It's going to trigger us to mean it's a respiratory alkalosis. Okay. Or ask, yeah, alkalosis. All right. Things that trigger it are going to be fear, anxiety, stress, pain. Lots of different things will trigger it. The important thing to remember when we deal with patients that are having hyperventilation syndrome is we want to identify what's causing it. Don't just assume they're doing it because they have fear or anxiety. There could be an underlying cause that's there. All right. Pain could be causing this. Hypoxia itself could be causing the hyperventilation. You need to make sure that you figure out what's causing it before you just allude it to being some type of psychological issue. All right. So the key is going to be to slow down the respiratory rate when we treat this um, and try to get them to breathe more slowly, hold on to that CO2 as much as they can, and uh, only exhale what absolutely has to be done. you got to break the cycle. Once you break the cycle, usually things will return to normal. But you're not going to break the cycle in 10 seconds. You're not going to break the cycle of their breathing pattern by just saying, quit your breathing like that. 
you're going to have to try some different techniques. Whether it means you breathe and the patient breathes with you, which is a technique that I commonly utilize. Counting is another method that works really well. Again, you've got to find something that's going to break that pattern. All right. Um, again, don't misdiagnose a problem with hyperventilation and just allude it to being a psychological issue. Again, you want to make sure it's not some other underlying cause that's causing it. Um, carpal pedal spasms is going to be a classic thing that we see with that. Um, the spasm and tingling of the hands and feet. Um, again, we see that secondary to the hyperventilation. Hyperventilation, that's due to blowing off too much CO2. Too, blowing off CO2 or respiratory alkalosis is going to cause lightheadedness. Lightheadedness, I can't talk tonight. Tingling sensation around the lips. Um, and a metallic taste of the mouth. Um, hyperventilation syndrome never occurs in unconscious patients. And why is that here? Why am I emphasizing that point? Why am I emphasizing that hyperventilation never occurs in unconscious patients? So if you have somebody that's completely unconscious and unresponsive and they're breathing 40 times a minute, are they having hyperventilation syndrome? No. Why are they breathing 40 times a minute? There's something wrong with them. There is something wrong with them. The answer is we don't know right now because we don't know what the patient is, but something is causing that, and you need to figure out what's causing that. All right, or do your best to figure out what's causing that. Try to fix and correct the problem. All right. Um, putting them on a partial rebreather mask is a good idea when we're talking about this. At six to eight liters per minute. We don't do the old paper bag trick anymore. That doesn't work. Um, don't put them on a non-rebreather mask at two liters per minute. I've, I've heard of people doing that before. Um, the ideal method is to put them on six to eight liters per minute on a partial non-rebreather or put them on a non-rebreather at 15 and coax their breathing. But let them get that supplemental oxygen and again and help them to work on and get their breathing to a better check. Um, but again, you want to try to do your best to reduce the patient's anxiety and get them to breathe more slowly. That is the key overall management of this. Explain to the patient that they're breathing too fast. Establish eye contact and get good rapport with the patient. And that's important to do. You've got to get a rapport and you've got to establish yourself with these patients and get them to trust you. If you can't get them to trust you, you're not going to get them to, to, to slow down. All right. Breathe with the patient. And again, when we first start out, we breathe with them the same speed that they're breathing at. And then we slowly bring it down as we as we get in sync with them. Again, as we get into sync, hopefully everything will follow. Just like if you yawn, okay? If I yawn, somebody else is going to yawn. It's just it's contagious. It passes, and that's what we're hoping is going to happen with the breathing. Don't succumb to hyperventilation yourself. And I put that here because it truly happens sometimes, okay? <clears throat> you get in there, you start hyperventilating with the patient, and the next thing you know. You're hyperventilating, and once you get into that cycle, it's hard to get out of it, okay? So be careful about that. Oxygen. Oxygen comes from lots and lots of different sources, and that's something that we need to remember. There's liquid oxygen. There's our main oxygen cylinders. There's our uh, portables. Lots and lots of different types of oxygen sources, all right? We all know what a flow meter is. I hope at this point in time we know what a flow meter is. Uh, but again, that is what enables the flow of oxygen to be regulated and attached to a high pressure connector. Right? There's no way that we could use straight up oxygen. We, we know if we don't have a flow meter on the oxygen and we crack that oxygen bottle open twice, what's it going to do? It blows out pure air. And how much pressure do we have in that tank? A lot. Typically about 2,000 psi. Okay, so we have all that oxygen coming out of there at once. What does the flow meter do? It knocks that oxygen down into a pressure that we can actually utilize and it's a therapy level. Okay, so again, we've got uh, liquid and high pressure compressed gas oxygen are our two types. Don't typically have liquid oxygen on ambulances. Some of the specialty ambulances with specialty transports do carry liquid oxygen, but again, most of the time they carry high, high pressure compressed gas. All right, it's stored in steel or aluminum. Uh, most of them are aluminum nowadays, thank God. Uh, some of you may still have steel tanks and they weigh a ton. Um, 
Throw that on top of your airway bag with everything else, and you've got a real heavy bag. All oxygen tanks in the United States are marked green, because green is the color of oxygen. Um, and they're all available in different sizes with uh, a letter designating their size. We carry typically what size in our oxygen tanks? Or in our, 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 our O2 bags, rather? Hmm. H? No. D. D. And typically we carry M's or H's or our mains in the back of the truck. The bigger the letter, the bigger the tank. The smaller the letter, the smaller the tank. What's the size tank is grandma pulling around through the store? G. E. E cylinders typically. All right. <coughs> so compressed gas tanks have on off valves with their physical standard sizing pins that align only with regulators for mechanical oxygen. And that's important to remember. That's the pin index safety system. All right. That allows us to only put a regulator on. That ha pertains to uh, to oxygen. And that means we can't put it uh, uh, put a put an O2 regulator on a bottle of acetylene. Okay, so we're not going to have grandma breathing in garlic flammable uh, gas. We, we, we do have liquid oxygen as an alternative. Um, it is more commonly used. Um, they weigh less than. Uh, uh, than uh, many of the tanks, and they hold larger volumes of oxygen. They are expensive and they have to be stored upright. Uh, and again, they, we see them more and more commonly in EMS nowadays, but again, mostly uh, we can see. Uh, <coughs> so we have a D cylinder, 414 liters per minute, or 414 liters. And we have a flow rate of 15. How long is that going to last? Somebody do that math for me. 414 divided by 15. Should I play the Jeopardy theme? 27.6. 27.6. So that means a full tank, you get 27 minutes of oxygen off of a D cylinder with somebody that's got 15 liters per minute. Okay. So you want to avoid draining the tank completely. Change the tank when it's between two and 300. Most of us have a policy that if it's 500, we need to change it out. All right, but uh, we want to leave a little bit of air in there because we don't want it to completely go go dry in terms of the gas. So we don't want moisture and other contaminants to enter the tank and sit in there and cause rust. Humidifiers. We use humidifiers, uh, humidifiers to get the, the air humidified. It's especially important in this part of the world because that oxygen that comes out of those tanks is dry. The air we breathe is already dry. Um, so again, the humidifier is going to help to uh, uh, humidify the gas. The amount of energy required um, to humidify the gas we breathe depends on the temperature and the humidity. All right. So humidity is the percentage of the maximum amount of water that, uh, that a gas could hold at a given temperature. So our humidity varies daily. Uh, from anywhere from 20 to 40 percent in everywhere else in the world. In New Mexico, we know that we have what type of humidity? Low. Low. So typically we're sitting around 9, 10%, if that much. Um, so again, humidifying the gas is always a good idea. So, <coughs> so oxygen that comes from a tank can be very, uh, um, very dry. And if the wintertime, it can be cold. So this puts stress on the body. So that's why we humidify it. Um, it makes the patient more comfortable. Uh, and allows uh, the patient to benefit uh, from that gas better because again we want to part of the dose's job is to moisten and humidify uh, more, humidify and warm up the air so if we humidify it we need things along much better so we have these inline humidifiers oxygen bubbles through the water um, and this increases the relative humidity um, and if we warm up that water it'll increase the temperature as well so, uh, supplemental oxygen delivery devices. Again, we've got lots of things out there, ranging from nasal cannulas to breathers. Um, 
what's bright for the patient is what we need to choose, whether it's a low flow, high flow, or medium flow. Um, but again, what concentration of oxygen do we need to give that patient? Nasal cannula. We all know what a nasal cannula is. Prongs in the nose, probably the most common device that we use. It's going to deliver a small amount of air uh, to the nose. Um, anywhere from 21 to 44 percent gas is what we're going to get of oxygen. Um, the thing to remember is after about six liters per minute, the nasal cannula becomes very uncomfortable because it's like shooting a rocket up somebody's nose. If you don't think that six liters is uncomfortable, I challenge you to go get a nasal cannula and turn it on to about 12 liters per minute and shoot that up your nose and see how you like it. All right. Always remember that. All right. The fact about it is nasal cannulas are very comfortable for the patient. Um, and it usually gives us enough supplemental oxygen uh, to get the patient up to a, to a good gas level. Because mm -hmm. again, we're going to be any, delivering them anywhere from, you know, 24 to 44% uh, gas. Um, so, uh, things that we want to be careful with, patients that have poor respiratory effort, we don't want to really use a nasal cannula on them. Patients that have severe hypoxia, apnea, and mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is kind of a relative contraindication to that because what can we always do with that? Tell them to breathe through their nose. Well, what if they can't breathe through their nose? What if it's all stopped up? Suction. Yeah, have them breathe through their mouth. Or again, use some other type of oxygen delivery device. Simple face masks. They have those out. Most hospitals have them. I can tell you most ambulance services don't. Most ambulance services carry an honor breather mask. That's, that's what we use. But a simple face mask is a medium flow oxygen delivery device, and it gives us 40 to 60% inspired oxygen at 10 liters. Okay? And that is a simple face mask. You can, not commonly seen, but they are out there. Um, you want to explain to patients why we're using a mask. Because patients don't like masks. Uh, number one, the, what, give me a reason why patients don't like masks. You're putting some over their face. You're putting some over their face and they're already having trouble breathing. So you, they feel like you're trapping them and they don't like it. So we don't, again, you're going to have to coast them a little bit and let them know why you're giving them this uh, so that way that you to convince them. If you can't get them to tolerate it, obviously go to a nasal cannula and give them that because a little bit's better than nothing. All right. Um, you may also have the patient, if they can, and they're able to conscious and follow directions, have them just hold the mask over their face. Okay, that's better than nothing, because a lot of times we put that strap on, they're just simply not going to like it. Uh, so simple face mask, you really don't want to use it with severe hypoxia, and obviously apnea, it's not going to work, because you're not ventilating, they're not going to air in and out. Non-rebreathing masks, um, they have a, a side force and oxygen tubing, and the reservoir and that reservoir is what allows us to get up to that 90 to 100 percent concentration you can have that oxygen reservoir bag down there the one-way valve in a non-rebreather mask uh, allows the or prevents the patient's mm -hmm. exhaled breath from mixing with the oxygen in the reservoir and the gas in the reservoir gets built up there for large volumes um, and allows them to have uh, have it available for inhalation all right. If you've ever had a patient that really has struggling to breathe and you put them on an honor breather mask and you see them collapse that uh, reservoir bag, you know, you, know, you know they're struggling to breathe. But you will have patients there that are gasping and that oxygen hungry. The other thing about an honor breather mask is they're going to have a one-way valve that covers the course of the mask, reducing the amount of room air entering. Um, and again, it gives us the highest concentration of oxygen possible without an airtight seal. We're going to get as close to 100% as we're going to possibly be able to by using an onward breather mask. And we typically put it on at 12 to 15 liters per minute. So high concentration oxygen. We don't want to use it on apnea or patients that have a poor respiratory effort. Okay. Uh, again, just like any other mask, it could actually make the patient feel uh, claustrophobic. Partial non-rebreather or partial rebreathing mask, uh, very similar to a non-rebreathing mask, except there's no one-way valve between the mask and the reservoir. So patients are still going to rebreathe a little bit of their exhaled CO2. Not a problem, uh, but again, it's there, and that's why that's what has there.
to be God honest with you, this is the most common thing that we have in EMS. We typically don't even have true non-rebreather masks. We have partial non-rebreathers. <clears throat> they are useful when we want to increase a patient's PaCO2. Um, so if we've got somebody that's hyperventilating, they're going to be rebreathing some of their carbon dioxide, which is a good thing. Mm. Um, but the oxygen is going to enrich that air and make it much better. Um, you can convert a non-rebreathing mask to a partial rebreathing mask by just removing that one-way valve down there between the reservoir and the uh, and the mask. So if you look down there on the reservoir, you pop that off. You don't want to really want to use it on apneic and poor respiratory effort patients. I uh, want to be careful, careful with that, just like the other mask. Venturi masks. How many of you have heard or ever used a venturi mask? Heard of them, never used them. Okay, venturi masks used to be very common, not so much anymore. The thing about them is you can dial, dial in the exact percentage of oxygen that you're utilizing. So COPD patients used to be standard. You put them on a Venturi mask because you can dial in that you want them on 24% oxygen or you can dial in 40% oxygen and that's how much oxygen you give them. You dial it in on the mask. Okay. Oh, again, not really an essential thing that we have, but it is really, really good for patients that are going to be a long-term oxygen therapy that are COPD patients. So you still may occasionally enter a Venturi mask. All right. But again, it gives you that fine control of FiO2. Flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation devices. Uh, very com common uh, nowadays. Again, they used to be very common back in the day. They kind of fell out of favor. Now they're coming back. Um, our manual transport ventilators are, operate off the same principle. Uh, but they assist ventilations in apneic or hypoventilating patients. Uh, again, they push the button and uh, it inflates. It forces that in. Okay. So the uh, the flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation devices have a demand valve, um, which when a patient starts to inhale, it's going to trigger, which is going to force that air in. Um, so it's going to deliver 100% oxygen as the patient begins to inhale, and as soon as they quit inhaling, it's going to stop. Okay. <clears throat> it does make an airtight seal with the patient's face. Uh, the patient is almost inhaling 100% oxygen when we have them on a, uh, uh, on a low restricted oxygen powered ventilation device. Um, thing about it is if they're conscious and they're able to use this, they want to hold it to their face. It makes things the most comfortable for them. Um, the masks are relatively expensive and are typically not disposable so that's again another downfall but they do have some disposable masks out there on the market now. Um, they don't work on apneic patients. Why do they not work on apneic patients? Because they're not breathing. Yeah, because they, they're not going to trigger the valve. So uh, so again that's going to be a contraindication for using this. And somebody that's got a poor respiratory effort, again we may want to consider just manually ventilating them in this case. Tracheostomy masks we know what a tracheostomy is. Uh, it's a, just a mask we put over the top of the stoma to help uh, del deliver supplemental oxygen. If we don't have a tracheostomy mask, what can we use? A non-rebreather. Yeah, we can use a pediatric non-rebreather. Or we can get the, most tracheostomies have that 15 millimeter connector there. We can just plug on into that and help uh, ventilate through that, uh, through that device or hook them up to our ventilator. All right. But again, you've got to be able to adapt and overcome to these situations. All right. But again, if you don't have a specific tracheostomy mask that's going to attach onto that tracheostomy, just use a non-rebreather mask. All right. Um, get about done with this lecture. Almost done, guys. Um, all oxygen delivery devices uh, can be used on pediatric patients. The only difference is we're going to use smaller devices. All right. You can. Um, however, if we have to, we can adjust adult uh, adult sizes uh, too, and tailor them to work on these patients. Um, blow by oxygen. Tell me about blow by oxygen. If we use it with uh, children because they don't like the mask going over the mouth. Yeah. How can we give blow by oxygen? Well, non-rebreather at fifteen. Just hold it by their face. Yeah. Poke a okay. hole in a cup. Poke a hole in a cup. That's a good one. Or the little, the little teddy bears they have. Ah, the little gas teddy bears. All right. They really freak me out because I always think of like uh, the Joker with those. You know, the little. They're not very soft. The poison, poisonous gas coming out of them. You know. 
So again, those are the ways we do. You know, we just got to adjust and overcome the kit. All right. You can also see that with the blow by, you can also just uh, put the tubing up by their mouth and have mom hold it because it's better than better than nothing. All right. CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. Love CPAP. It's a great tool. Uh, it's available to us. It's the best thing to come to EMS since Johnny and Roy. Because um, <clears throat> what we have noticed is we notice that a considerable improvement in our patients that we use that are having respiratory respiratory distress. Um, patients that have pulmonary edema, patients that have COPD, uh, we notice profound improvement in these patients. So the way CPAP works is it maintains positive pressure uh, through the tube or, or through the airway constantly, even during exhalation. The way I like to describe CPAP is if you've ever rode in the back of a pickup truck and tried to breathe as you forcefully exhale in the back of the truck it's kind of hard to breathe you got to forcefully exhale same thing with CPAP but what that does is it keeps those alveoli open which allows for that air to move back in a lot a lot quicker and a lot easier so that's going to greatly improve drastically the patient's uh, ventilatory effort and ventilatory function um, again we if we have patients that are worried about atelectasis or collapse of the alveolar sacs. Uh, patients that have pulmonary edema, this is going to be a great uh, alternative to it for us to, to maintain their airway. Um, again, we're able to use and utilize and perform better gas exchange by keeping those airways open because we're not having to force the airways back open because they completely collapse down. Um, you can also get uh, CPAP by placing a peep valve between the endotracheal tube and the ventilation device. So we'll play with this in the lab a little bit with the utilization of a peep valve. Uh, what is PEEP? Anybody know what PEEP stands for? No. Positive and expiratory pressure. Uh, and that caught, it's kind of the same thing as, as, as uh, CPAP. Again, on a CPAP patient, they have to be breathing. A uh, PEEP, we can put PEEP on patients that are even apneic. And again, it's going to keep those airways open. Okay, um, so again, it provides that constant flow of breathing gas uh, into the lungs. How would you use it on a, on an apneic patient when they never work? You can't use CPAP on an apneic patient because they have to be able to breathe. But you can use PEEP on an on an apneic patient. Yeah, like between the bag and, and the BVM. Yeah. Okay. So CPAP is going to reduce the work of breathing because it increases exhalation. All right, the problem is eliminated by a new uh, uh, or by the uh, positive airway pressure or by level or BiPAP, which decreases the pressure during exhalation. All right, um, we have patients that have we put them on CPAP. One of the biggest downfalls that we see is because we're putting that extra pressure in their chest, we cause a drop in cardiac output and if we have a drop in cardiac output what do we see how are we going to see a drop in cardiac output what are we going to see in their vital signs their blood pressure is going to drop so that's what we've got to watch out for and we've got to be careful of so what about if we have that patient that's got a blood pressure of 60 over 40 and is struggling to breathe are they going to be a good candidate for CPAP no no, because again, we're going to put too much stress there.